Well, good morning, church. As Grant mentioned, my name is Sam. I'm one of the members uh, of this church that gathers here on a Sunday. I'm also privileged to be uh, an elder that serves this church, and it's my uh, absolute uh, desire that this morning we would learn from God's Word, that we would be able to hear from Him what He has to say to us in these uh, short but yet uh, poignant, I want to call it, uh, passages. It's again uh, Jesus that is speaking uh, and Jesus that is teaching us. So I hope that you have been enjoying uh, your time in the series in Matthew. It's been 10 weeks now that we've been looking at passages uh, of the teachings in Matthew as, the, as Jesus has taught us, has been teaching the crowds and more importantly, his disciples of the gospel, the good news, news that for the ages past had been hidden, but now through Jesus, the wisdom of God is being revealed to those who are being saved. Jesus was teaching all the people that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, God's kingdom, and the kingdom, sorry, and the kingdom of God's forever king has come. For since Abraham, 1900 years before Jesus, God had promised that he would bless him and that through him his descendants and ultimately all the nations of the world. God had revealed himself to the nation of Israel and after rescuing them from slavery, taught them to love him with all their heart, mind and soul and to love one another. And if they did this, then out of all the nations of the world, they would be his special possession, his treasure. That God would act as a father to them, that he would protect and provide for them everything that they needed. And yet even with the presence of God among them and in their nation, they rejected him and sought after other gods. In the passage that we're looking at today, we come to the end of what seems like a very busy day for Jesus. And it was no ordinary day. It was a Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, a day on which God had said to his people, on it you shall rest and do no work. It was meant to be a day of rest unto the Lord, and yet it is on this day that we see Jesus doing the work of his Father in heaven according to his perfect will preaching and teaching the people about the kingdom of heaven, which he had come to reveal and make known. For since the beginning of the world, we've been waiting for the one, the seed of the woman that would come and crush Satan's head, the one who will sit on King David's throne, whose dominion and reign will last forever and ever. And meanwhile, throughout all the Old Testament, we have God saying to his people, all day long I have been holding out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. But to those who long for righteousness and the hope that they have in God's salvation, he now says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And so Jesus has been teaching the crowds about the kingdom of heaven. After spending the day contending with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, healing the broken and the sick, teaching the crowds that followed him with parables, which in essence is a simple story that illustrates a reality or a truth, we now find Jesus inside the house, teaching his disciples these wonderful truths that we read today. In all the other parables Jesus has taught in Matthew 13, he is speaking of the way that the word goes out into the world, and that word divides between those he has chosen and those who reject him. And when his, disi when his disciples asked him why Jesus spoke in parables, he told them plainly back in verse 11, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. This was for his disciples. 
The secrets are for the children of his kingdom, who will be called out of the darkness and into the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as Jesus is inside the house with his disciples, he now turns his attention to teach them two parables about the value of the kingdom of God. And as we walk through this passage of Scripture this morning, we're going to be looking at three points. First, the value of the kingdom, the scope of the kingdom, and the teachers of the kingdom. That is, the value of the kingdom, the scope of the kingdom, and the teachers of the kingdom. Well, let's start by reading the first parable in Matthew 13, verse 44, about the value of the kingdom. Verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. The first thing to notice is that the treasure is hidden. It wasn't there in plain sight. And the second thing to notice is that the man found something he did not go out to seek. Jesus is telling his disciples that there will be those that will not be seeking the kingdom of heaven, but they will discover it. And it will cause an overwhelming joy like they have never felt before. The reason I say this is that because Jesus tells us he immediately went into action and was determined to get this treasure. And the parable tells us that there is only one way, and that is to sell all that he has in order to buy that field and so gain the treasure which he hid in it. What he has is exactly the price to own it. And we can only imagine how much he valued this treasure. Think about it, church. What could be so valuable to you that it would motivate you to give up everything you have in order to get it? Could it be a partner? Maybe your children? Some men have sold their souls for a career. But what would be so valuable that you'd sell everything you had in order to obtain it? Because that is what this man did. And he didn't do it grudgingly, but with joy. Overwhelming joy. The third thing that we notice is that he had everything he needed in his possession to purchase the field in order to obtain the treasure. It wasn't beyond his reach. It's just that it cost him all he had. And this is where we see how this applies to us as we relate to the kingdom of heaven. See, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. The treasure is a free gift, but it will cost you everything to get it. No price tag, but Jesus wants all of our hearts. That's why he wants all that each of us has. This is why the poor old woman at the temple and the rich young ruler were worlds apart in what they owned. But Jesus says that even though the woman gave two small copper coins, it was all she had. And let me tell you, it takes a lot of faith to give it all up for the sake of God. And therefore, she was justified before God because what she was willing to give was proof that she valued the kingdom of heaven more than she valued herself. Whereas the rich young ruler, by asking Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? He could not bring himself to do what it took to get it. It was not about the amount Jesus was standing right there in front of him, asking him to give it all away and follow him. 
Jesus is the treasure because he is the way, the truth and the life. And it was not as though his effort was going to go to waste. For Jesus promises that by doing this one thing, he would gain treasure in heaven. But this rich man couldn't see what the poor woman saw. And so what she obtained with her two little copper coins, this rich man lost because he failed to see the value of the treasure that stood in front of him. In the context of considering the cost of discipleship, if you must ask, what do I have to give up? Then you're asking the wrong question. When you see your treasure in the kingdom of heaven by the power of God, you will give up everything to have it. Well, Jesus goes on in verse 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus is teaching his disciples and us what the kingdom of heaven is like. And in this parable, the seeker finds which he sought after. The first man found what he wasn't looking for. But this man finds what he is seeking. A rare jewel, which in this case is represented by a precious pearl. Flawless, perfect. Only a flawless pearl can be of great value. And it would cost everything he had to obtain it. This man was a merchant he lives to buy and sell. That's his living. And yet for the sake of this great treasure, he does away with it all, leaves it all behind and takes hold of that life, which is true life. The question the rich young ruler asked was, what must I do to have eternal life? And that was and still is the only question worth asking Jesus. And his response was just as simple. Obey the commandments and do good. But Jesus clearly replies to him with what he had lacked. Because he says, what you're really asking me is what is your part in this? Because the question you asked is, what must I do? And so Jesus tells him, go. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Not because you can buy your way into the kingdom. But because Jesus is after our hearts. And so he challenges this man to empty his heart from his wealth. And to prove to this poor soul that what he values is his wealth more than the kingdom of heaven. Jesus asks a similar question to the crowd in Matthew 16. He says, what could you give in exchange for your soul? Because he has just finished telling them, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see again in this, Jesus is teaching us the value of the kingdom compared with all the treasure in the world. That is why Luke 12 says, you don't need to turn there. Let me read this. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, 
a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. You see, church, to those that have found this treasure, these words of Jesus are like Job's from the Old Testament, who declares, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Brothers and sisters, the message that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life is the gospel it is the good news because this treasure is given to us free of charge and when we see it we are overwhelmed by it and so we should be and like the men in these parables we should give up everything for it the eternal life Jesus came to offer was purchased for us through his atoning sacrifice made on the cross that those who put their faith in him and count the cost and follow him they will get to inherit eternal life which is true life it is in the presence of God where he says I will be their God and they will be my people and I will wipe every tear from their eye and never again will there be any death or sorrow or pain. The inheritance is the new heaven and the new earth. The reality is we become heirs and co-heirs with Christ. We become the children of God, a kingdom of priests unto the Lord, doing His will and pleasing the one that saved us and we do not have in the English language the ability to describe the wonder and magnificence of that day and the reality that Jesus here is telling us in these parables if only you knew this would mean everything to you Church, Jesus can't be any clearer. For he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good would it be for anyone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what could you give in exchange for your soul? You know, Jesus does not ask any more from us than what he himself was ready to sacrifice. For the Lord left his throne in heaven to come to us as a man. And the Bible says that he emptied himself of all but love. And he willingly gave it all for our sins. Sorry, he willingly gave it all up in order to come and make the perfect sacrifice. To give his life as a ransom for our sins on the cross. Jesus gave it all up in order to gain the world inside which was a hidden treasure. His treasured possession the true children of God. I hope you can see your worth in light of what Christ has done for you. There is so much more to say about the value of the kingdom, but the time is not sufficient for us this morning. But I plead with you, brothers and sisters, seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened. Ask, and it will be given. Well, Jesus continues his instruction. We'll read from verse 47.
Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm not sure how many of you here are fishermen, but this language would have been very familiar to most of the disciples who themselves were fishermen. Because the imagery here is of a dragnet that is pulled or dragged along by a fisherman's boat that catches within it everything from the bottom to the top. And this wonderful image of the net that catches all kinds of fish, which would mean all the nations into which the gospel is sent out. And just like the gospel, this net will reach far and wide. And we know that the gospel will go out into the whole world because John records for us in the book of Revelation the image of the end where he witnesses a great multitude before the throne of God and Jesus Christ in all his glory. And he sees this multitude which comes from every nation, language and tribe. And verse 48 says or begins with, When it was full, the time of judgment and separation will come. This age will end, as it says in verse 49. And that time and day is set. Jesus tells us that no one knows the day or time. Only the Father knows the exact time and day. And so it is set. And it is nearer now than when these ears first heard it over 2,000 years ago. And the image of the net being pulled up onto the shore means that the fish are no longer in an environment where they can continue to survive. Their destiny is set. There is no getting back into the water. No second chances. They await only the separation. Those who are in Christ into baskets for eternal life and those who reject him thrown into the blazing furnace for eternal destruction. And brothers and sisters, these passages today are meant to encourage us. For Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Jesus is not the one who drives away. But he has an adversary who wants to see you destroyed. Just like in the parable of the weeds, the people of the kingdom exist in the world among the people of the evil one. That is why Jesus asks his disciples in verse 51, Have you understood these things? To which they reply, yes. Isn't it remarkable, the response of the learned and wise? The Pharisees, who the Bible says were intently looking in the Scriptures for the salvation of God, who hear the words, but their response to Jesus is, they plotted how they might kill him. Yet the Lord's children, simple men, respond to Jesus' question, have you understood these things? With a yes. They understood that Jesus came to bring good news to a world that is under the curse of sin and death. And they understood that through Jesus, God was going to reap a harvest among mankind to save a people for himself, to enjoy for all eternity. And so he tells them our third point for today, and that is that the disciples are the ones who will become the teachers of the kingdom. Let's read verse 52.
He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. In the Old Testament, there's a book of Proverbs. And Proverbs 24 says, By the wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Jesus here is imparting to the disciples something about the wisdom of God. Listen to what 1 Corinthians says. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. You see, church, these few little verses in Matthew, through which Jesus is teaching us, that every teacher of the law who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of the house who brings out of their storeroom, out of their mind, their memory, their thoughts, new treasures as well as old treasures, who lives and learns and then shares with others. We learn from God what he has said to us in the scriptures Sorry, we learn from God what he has said to us in the scriptures as he prepared his people for the coming of the Savior. And God adds to that the knowledge of the kingdom that has been revealed to us through the teaching of Jesus Christ. See, as some of you might know, I'm currently renovating the family home. What well, started off as a renovation <laughs> became a complete knockdown and rebuild. But we started with the foundations. And the foundations need to be made strong and true. Before we add any of the finishing touches, we need to make sure that the base is true, the frames are true, the bricks are true. The roof is true. Because a house that seems to be finished well, but has a poor foundation, will fall apart. The cracks will show. But a house with a good foundation will finish well, and it will stand the test of time. And this is what Jesus is teaching us about a good teacher of God's kingdom. They will have the foundation and the finish. They will have the framework that includes the whole building from the foundation in the Old Testament to the final finish revealed in the New. You will know the real kingdom teachers by what they say, whether they're accurately teaching about Jesus in light of all the scriptures that they have said about him. As you know, Jesus would end the parables with whoever has ears, 
knowing that even among his disciples, there are those that believed and there are those that doubted. And if you are willing to listen, Jesus is speaking to us today. And if you doubt, pray to God that he would help you to see what he has freely given us in the one he loves. I'll read one final passage to us from Colossians. This says it so much better than I can. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Church, Jesus is the treasure. And the value of the kingdom that he came to reveal, we will all get to enjoy in the new creation with him. Jesus is our creator and our saviour. He is our teacher and the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We are, to, we are told in the book of Revelation that Jesus is worthy to be praised for all eternity because he was slain and with his blood he purchased people from among every tribe, nation and language. He is valued by the church because he valued us. And we have been loved by God and set free by his spirit to love him. And let's make sure that we help each other to do this by valuing the kingdom of heaven in our own hearts and in our own minds and helping others to do the same. Let me pray. Oh, our loving Father, these wonders, these truths, these revelations of our Lord and Saviour, our King who is to come, our King who now reigns forever and ever. Lord, if we could see the beginning, the end from the beginning, if we could see the reality of who we are in Christ, the worth that you place on those who call on you, who call you Father, who call Jesus Lord and Saviour. Oh, this reality that will one day be revealed, too wonderful to imagine or to even describe in words. And yet there is this treasure that we have inside these bodies that are fading away. And Lord, we just want to pray that you will continue to make these truths known to us. Give us the ears to hear. Give us the eyes to understand. Give us the heart to be in full joy of this knowledge of knowing that our Savior came, he died and he rose again, that we may have this hope, this sure hope of our salvation that is to come. Lord, help us to lay down all that we have for the sake of our Lord and Savior, who gave up everything for us. Help us not to hold on to the things of this world, but to hold on to that which will last forever. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you that we have saints here, brothers and sisters, who together encourage one another onto that day until our Lord shall return that we don't get to do this as a solo journey, but we do it as brothers and sisters, the family, the bride of Christ. We just want to give you all praise and glory this morning, Lord, for you are worthy. In Jesus' precious name, amen.